Okay. Yesterday, um, we talked about how to acquire honeybees and where do you get them. And, and now today, we're going to do it a little bit more advanced. And we're going to talk about what you do once you get the honeybees. Um, let's talk a little bit about a, a bee yard. Um, this is a nice bee yard. You can see right here for a backyard, it's got a bench where you can sit and watch the bees fly and really enjoy them. Um, that's a, a really nice thing. Um, wild bees, feral bees, and managed bees, there's really no difference between all of these. Um, your managed bees are not tame bees, they're still wild bees. There's no domestication of bees. It's just that we try to, or we think that we can manage them, and so we keep them and put them in boxes that work good for us to extract the honey. But otherwise, bees are bees, and if they're wild or feral, they're still the same as the bees that are in your box. Um, where should you place a hive is a, is a really common question. Um, these hives are in the shade a little bit, but they hopefully have morning sun on them. Next to that building, it's a deciduous tree so that in the wintertime, it's going to lose its leaves, and then they can pick up the warmth of the sun and also the reflective heat off the building. But in the summertime, it's going to help keep them cool in the hot afternoons. And so as you're looking for a place to put your bees, your first concern would be your neighbors. Um, a water source, they're going to need the closest water source is where they're going to go. So if your neighbors have a rock garden with a, a waterfall in it or something like that, that's where the bees are going to go unless you supply them water. And so as you're keeping bees and setting up your, and thinking about where to put your bee colonies, water is your first resource. And second is the morning sun. It is, it's really important that they get that first morning sun to get warmed up and keep the health of the hive and also the, the winter sun where you're going to winter them so that they have a little bit of shade in that hot summer's afternoon. But uh, then in the winter time, you, want that you don't want that shade. You want them to stay nice and warm. Um, barricades. Um, when the bees come out of their front door, they come out in a bee line and head straight to their nectar source. So if you face the hive towards where your neighbor has a barbecue area or something like that, depends on if you like your neighbor or not, it's a good or a bad idea. But uh, it uh, helps a lot to kind of aim the doorway towards some bushes or something, so that those bees come out and have to go up higher and fly out, then they're, they're on their flightways and they don't bother anybody. I've seen some bee yards where they actually grow um, cedars around them so that it's enclosed and the bees come out, do a, a dust devil or a bead whirl up and then fly out and nobody, they don't disturb anybody that way. So you can think of in terms like that, bees get to fly so they can fly up and then out. Um, Hives on rooftops is also a, a big thing in, in urban areas that you can actually, if you have a flat roof or um, somewhere where you can get them up off the ground, then that works also, rooftop hives. Um, when do you work your bees? You want to, to work them if your neighbors are out and having backyard activities or front yard activities or just mowing the lawn, it's probably not a really good time to disturb your bees and get them all excited. And so when you're working your bees and managing your bees, you want to kind of look around with their kids playing and, and stuff like that and maybe work them later in the afternoon. It seems that when you work your bees later in the afternoon and they're disturbed, it's less time to bedtime. And so they're, they'll sleep that night and then they, they won't uh, be bothering the neighbors all day long. If you work them in the morning, then it seems like that hive is upset all day long and angry. Uh, more apt to sting, so if you do it in the evening, that's a, a lot better on the bees. Um, they recommend three or four hives at uh, the most on a half acre lot in the city. That, that's, that's, a, that's my opinion also. If you have two or three, maybe even four hives, and you're keeping them with good genetics so that they're gentle, then, I, then that's pretty much doable. Um, if you have a mean colony, um, it's kind of hard to explain what a mean colony is, but they basically have bad attitudes. And so if you have a bad attitude colony, um, we need to get that requeened right away so the genetics change and that that colony settles down and isn't so upset and grumpy all the time. Um, also, this is what I find works really good. A pound or two of honey to each one of the neighbors. 
um, and a little visit. If they invite you in for tea or coffee or a cold drink, make sure you take them up on it and sit down and chat with them for a few minutes and a pound of honey goes a long ways. We do a lot of neighbor relations in our business. Um, uh, smoke. When you get ready to work your bees, have all your tools ready to go and have your smoker lit. Um, the smoke, I see of some new people today, the smoke, what it does is it trips a reflex in the bees that they gorge themselves on honey. It's like Thanksgiving dinner. They actually can't bend their thorax to sting you. So when a honeybee stings, it has to bend and then sting. With a full tummy, it can't do that as readily. And that's what the smoke does. It also drives the bees, but they also gorge themselves on honey. So have your smoker lit, your tools ready to go. Know exactly what you're going to do in your hive and then commence on doing it, get it done, put it back together, and then leave them alone and they'll have a lot less agitated bees for the neighbors. Um, what do you see when you open the colony? Um, when you open up the bees, the first thing you want to do is crack the lid off. I don't use inner covers on mine, but a lot of hobbyists do. The inner cover is actually just a um, plate underneath the lid. and You'll peel that off and then the bees are exposed underneath with all the frames on there. Give them a little smoke, and you don't want to use too much smoke, it just takes a little bit. Um, and that calms the bees down and drives them back down in the box a little bit when you're going to do your management and uh, get ready to work them. He has his smoker lit walking into the bee yard. That's like ringing the doorbell. If somebody just walks into your house and goes right to the refrigerator, it kind of makes you upset a little bit. But if they ring the doorbell and, you know, what's for lunch, then things go a, a lot smoother. Um, I use dead sagebrush in my smoker. Um, one, because the pine seems to be a little bit more acidic and my sister hates it. <laughs> but sagebrush burning, kind of, it, it's okay when you have to smell it all day long. Burlap works really well, too. The burlap's kind of in short supply. Um, work your hive from the side. Um, so well, that's going back to the, the entrance again. If you stand in front of the bees, they're running into you and you're blocking the bees behind you can't get in. And so you want to stand off to the side and you also want to approach the hive from the side. That way you're not alerting the bees and, and getting in the middle. And when you take off the lid, don't set it in front of the hive either. Then the bees can't get in, they can't get out. And, um, and not too much smoke. Um, moving slowly works until you get a lot of hives and you got to get the work done and then you kind of speed up and uh, go probably a little bit too fast but uh, just be gentle with them it seems like a sticks breaking when you you know snap sticks that vibration um, you know and, and being kind of rough with the bees disturbs them and you'll get a lot more stings when you're working your bees and a lot more aggravated bees if you just take a breath and, and uh, calm down a little bit and just go slow they work really well if the hive be does become uncro uncontrollable or you become overwhelmed, just close the hive up and then wait another day or two. And it, some, some beekeepers have to, when they're first starting out, it is quite overwhelming because you've got your bee suit on and then you've got all these bees in the air and they become very claustrophobic very quickly. That, uh, you know, they might have a thousand bees around their head buzzing and, and all the noise and the confusion and and such. So if you get overwhelmed, just close them up. It's not going to hurt them a bit and uh, work them another day. Um, your hive tool is really important. The bees will propolis and grow and uh, build burr comb all through the hive. Um, to keep that to a minimum, you kind of help them keep it cleaned out so that the frames don't crush each other. When you open up a beehive, you've got to take the, the end frame out first because that's the frame that the queen is less likely to be on. And so when you have to pry them over to pry that frame out, you're going to need the hive tool, and then you'll want to remove the burr comb so that next time you get in there, you don't crush the bees getting that first frame out. Um, and that's kind of how you hold the hive tool. Uh, what should you be looking for when you work the hive? Um, I guess the most important thing is, is to do the least amount of damage to the bees as possible. You definitely don't want to smash the queen. There's only one queen in there, and if you smash her and kill her, then that's going to be a lot of uh, extra work to try and get that hive queen right again, and also 
to uh, get a honey crop in because you're going to lose automatically 30 days there, 30 days of brew. Um, it's not necessary to actually find the queen. You can look in this slide and I can kind of see them in there, but down in the bottom of these cells, there's actually eggs that the queen has laid. And so we know it's going to be an egg for three days. And so when we look in there and we're looking in the, in the comb, we want to put the sun behind us so it comes over our shoulder and then you can tip that frame and see those eggs in there. And if you see eggs, you know there's a laying queen in there within three days. So she's great. And then you can also look and see what the brood pattern is. Um, you can see the, the cap is kind of interesting as long as there are eggs. And that way you don't have to look through every frame to see if you can find the queen, which takes forever. Uh, you know the queen's in there, and by looking at the brood, we know if the queen's doing well. I wear gloves. <laughs> um, like I say, there's a lot of beekeepers, some beekeepers that don't wear bells and uh, don't wear gloves. Then again, you look at this hive, at actually how many bees are in the box right there. This is a small nook. This, this isn't a colony with 60,000 bees in there. When a, when a bee stings, the first thing isn't the problem. It, it's, the, it's a cause. And what happens is that stinger tears out. And when it tears out, it, it, it relieves a pheromone. It, I kind of think it smells like bananas, a cross between lemongrass oil and, and bananas somewhere. But with this pheromone in the air, all the bees start to sting. And if you have a quarter-sized patch of skin exposed, and you get a bee sting there, within seconds you'll have five or six more because it's an alert pheromone that the bees use. A bloodhound, they say, can smell a hundred times better than we can. A honeybee can smell a thousand times better than a bloodhound. So their sense of smell is, is incredible. And once that pheromone is released, you're going to excite the whole hive you're gonna, and, and you're in trouble. Um, I had a beginning class that we went out to North Logan and we were working a beehive. And there was, oh, 10, and they were all new beekeepers. And one of the gals got a bee in her veil while we were working the hive and panicked. It just took her a split second to rip that veil off, and I couldn't even get a word out. And by the time I had done that, the veil was already over the back of her head, and she had realized what she had done. She not only had one bee now, she had the whole hive. And so it was a, it was a pretty traumatic experience. But uh, she told me a couple weeks later, she came up and gave me a hug, and she says, it's okay now, I know they can't kill me. <laughs> so what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, right? Um, this is a really good brood pattern right here, and, and it's kind of a really good picture. Um, this is sealed brood. This is capped brood. And to kind of put that into perspective, a queen in the springtime and, and early summer days will lay... 2,500 eggs a day, the, the reports vary. I think it can go up as high as 3,000 eggs a day. When a new queen is just mated and comes back to the hive and starts laying, she will lay every frame that the bees cover. And uh, I've seen eight frames of brood and not one sealed cell, so I know in the last eight days she's laid all those. Um, this is a very good frame. You can see that there's not very many holes. Um, a hole would be a missed a missed cell there and there. That is a very good sign of, of uh, good health, that the bees aren't sick at all. If all my frames looked like that, I'd be really, really, really happy. That is a, a class A frame right there. Also, um, when we have a frame out like this, we're looking at the bees' wings. You know, a, a healthy bee's wings will actually be translucent. Um, the color of them won't be cloudy. And so we can tell a lot by looking at the health of the hive from what the bee's wings are. Um, the age of the bee, if the wings are very tattered and, and worn, it's an older bee and, and a few things like that. We're also looking at the bees to see if we can see any mites on there. Um, we went over Varroa mites yesterday. Varroa came into the United States in 1984. They thought it was going to take about 20 years to go across the country. It did it in about 18 months. Um, they're very, very prolific. Um, bees kind of drift between hive to hive and take a lot of mites with them. Um, and the mites also carry a lot of viruses and disease. So that's a, that's a problem. Honeybees get sick and get the flu just like we do. If you sneeze, and in fact a lot of colds and viruses go between bees and humans. And so don't sneeze in your hives.
Um, we're also looking for queen cells. If you, you, know, you have a good brood pattern like this, the hive may be ramping up to swarm. It may be raising all those extra bees and it might have a, a couple of two or three queen cells hid and it's ready to swarm, which means it's going to have a baby beehive. And so that's another thing that we're looking for. Um, we're also looking for um, intruders into the hive. Mice are a problem, a weaker hive. The mice move in and, and build their homes and they're very happy to do so. Especially in the winter time because the bees are kind of almost in that hibernative state. They're warm, there's plenty of food for the mice and they move right in, um, but uh, a good kick will send that mouse out with uh, six or seven bees attached to it. So, that they're quick. Yellow jackets are a little bit of a problem. Um, wax moths in Cache Valley aren't really a big problem, but if you get outside of the valley where it's a little warmer, um, wax moths tend to be a little bit of a problem if you leave equipment out or it, it's warmer. Um, they actually lay an egg on the wax and then the, it's a worm that eats through and spins a, a silk web wherever it eats. It eats the impurities out of the wax. It makes a, a huge mess. Um, what's a good population of bees? And uh, That's when the bees are covering everything that they have. Um, so when you look in the boxes, if you see a brood pattern that is larger than the bees covering it, that's a quick sign that there's a, there's a problem with the bees because they're dying faster than the bees can populate and cover that brood to keep it warm. And so um, that's kind of a year-round thing that you need to watch for. Um, this is a, kind of a, a later picture in the fall. This is kind of what they look like. The hot summer afternoons, especially when you get to July and, and August, you'll see what we call bee beards on the hive. In the hot summer afternoons, they like to sit out on the porch at sunset just like we do. And you can imagine with 60,000 bees in that hive, um, it's hot and muggy in there, especially when they brought in a day's worth of honey. Um, you know, they'll gain a pound and a half, a pound, pound and a half, two pounds a day in honey, and put, they have to dry that out during the night. And so it can be very humid, and I don't blame them. I'd sit out on the front, too, and uh, enjoy the sunset. This is a swarm. Um, so when you see a large population that doesn't have enough room, you have two double deeps is normally what we run here. When the population gets too big and you get slow and don't get your honey supers on to give them enough room to expand into, that trips the, the swarming reflex. And so the bees will go into a swarming reflex. So you've got to be sure to get your honey supers on soon enough, but not too soon. And so you don't want to have overcrowded hives, and that's kind of a, an art form there because the hives move very, very quickly. In, in size. In the springtime, they really blossom. Um, so this is a, what happens when you get a little bit behind and you get some swarms hanging. Um, I asked a, a beekeeper friend of mine, I says, well, how do you prevent swarms? And he says, one thing's for sure, a dead hive never swarms. So that's the surefire way to keep your hives from swarming is dead bees. Um, good hives that are healthy, expect them to swarm. It's part of it. So in your neighborhood management, you need to kind of watch your hives and make sure that uh, maybe you need to do an artificial swarm on them. That's where you pull a nook, you know, three or four or five frames of brood out with one of those big queen cells and get it into another box and open that brood chamber up a little bit. For plenty of room. Maybe you can replace the queen if she stays swarming and keep that hive, yeah. That's the old queen that leaves first. And then if there's succeeding swarm cells, then the next queen in line. All the cells don't hatch at the same time. And the bees will actually keep the queen in there as she's trying to cut her way out. They will actually build the wax back around her to keep her in there until weather breaks or um, you know what it, they're ready to. And then they'll take off in a swarm and the new queen will hatch. If that, and they will also protect that cell from the old queen killing it. Because the old queen, if she gets to it, will drill a hole in the side and kill that queen. So sometimes in the springtime, oh, about the second week of May, when we open them up, all of a sudden, you know, all these queens are hatching. You'll pull a frame out and they'll have three or four um, queen cells along the bottom, and two of them will be hatching. And it's just that we've disturbed the hive, and now they're not keeping them sealed in there. So we'll take those and requeen hives and, and move those around. They're very, very good queens. 
Um, genetically, uh, the geneticists sometimes say that you know that's promoting the swarm gene using those. But uh, the swarm gene is also the same gene that is supersedure. So that's one of the main problems with uh, the queen industry today is that they bred out all the swarming characteristics. But now you no longer have a supersedure. So when that queen starts to fail, then the bees don't replace her as readily. And so that hive goes along, and then the queen turns into a drone layer and starts laying drones because she ran out of sperm, she's too old, and uh, ends up as a drone layer and the colony collapses and dies. And that's one of the problems in the industry, and, and what I've done is bred that swarm gene back in. Yeah, they might be a little swarmy, but they do have that supersedure coming back where they will replace that queen as soon as she starts to fail. So they just work as well. I like the story because I need to add water in it typically. It's a good picture to show the pollen. It kind of only shows one color of pollen, that's an orange pollen, probably um, dandelion or something off in the springtime. Um, it, it's very interesting to see all the different colors of pollen and, and uh, the different types. Each pollen also contains different amino acids. It's different, it's the protein for the bean food. And so you need a wide variety of pollen coming in, just like we couldn't survive just on potatoes. We, ha we have to have a, you know, potatoes and carrots and onions, the whole gamut. That's what pollen is to them, except in the protein. And they need that wide diversity to get all 96 different amino acids that they need to um, raise a good quality hive. And that's one of the problems that uh, we feed a pollen supplement that has a lot of different amino acids in it and, uh, to make sure that the bee's nutrition levels are met. So, and we feed that to the baby bee hives that may not have the field force to go out and collect enough pollen or we're close to a monoculture crop, meaning that everything's the same and we want that diversity in there so that they're, they're healthy. Um, one hive will consume 100 pounds of pollen. That's a pile of pollen about as high as this chair. And then pyramid it out, probably about a three foot circle on the bottom. That's a lot of pollen. Those people that have hay fever just cringe at that. But, uh, so if you only feed one pound of pollen substitute, then you're only affecting 1% of that total hives intake through the year. So you can kind of see, you know, maybe 10, 12 um, pounds of pollen, 15, um, maybe even 20. Then you're affecting these intake, which now you're really doing something. So it, it takes a lot more pollen substitute than how beekeepers think. Um, honey on the hive. If you've managed your colonies well, then you get to have some honey. Um, some of this is luck, and some of it is, is you can set the bees up to bring in a honey crop. That doesn't mean they're going to do it. This is a, a good honey super. Um, there, there's one thing I look at this, and I, I, for a long time, there's been a huge debate on honey that is derived from brood combs. These are actually brood combs. You can see by the, the frames how dark they are. You can see the dark wax and such like that. That's honey that has been captured in brood combs. When, when the queen lays, it lays an egg, it turns to a larva, and then it pupates. When it pupates, it actually spins a cocoon, just like a caterpillar, in the wax cell. And each time that that queen lays in there, it gets a new layer of that cocoon material. The bees kind of propolis it and clean it and shine it in. After time, there's not much wax left in there. It's basically the casks or the, those um, cocoons all stacked in there, different layers of it. becomes very strong, which is a lot easier to Don't put not as flimsy. So when you go through that centrifuge, it doesn't break the frame. For years, beekeepers have been doing that. One thing that we did in our operation is we put in new foundation and actually draw comb out on honey. At the front, it's But in the end, if you're going to go into a niche market and you're gonna sell a high quality product and demand a high quality price for it, then you've gotta have that clean honey. There is a flavor that's in that older comb. Right, mom? <laughs> and so, um, as you're doing that, think about that. It's gonna take you a little that comb, but if you're going to hand this somebody a jar of honey that you know, you want it to be the best honey that you possibly can. And there is a flavor difference. There's a 
huge flavor difference. There's also a color, a couple of color points. And when they talk about color, it goes from water white to very dark. And so you'll climb a couple color points in there, which um, is kind of important. Um, you also want to leave enough honey for bees to survive the winter. Um, people always ask, how much honey is that? Around here, it's about 80 pounds. Um, the bees will naturally arrange their hives so that the baby bees and the brood and some honey is in the bottom box. And then the next box in the fall will be completely honey. It, it'll be 80 pounds. All nine frames across there in a 10-frame box will be honey. And that's about what they're going to need to make it through May when they can start foraging a little bit. And, and especially if it's a cold, wet spring, then they're going to need that to get into mid-May to get some flight time. But that's for a honey super, and the reason why, that's a really good question. The reason why they did that is when um, the frames have to be decapped, you can see those cappings stick out a little bit further than the wood so that they're easier to trim off. If you had, if, when you first start seeing, you want to put 10 frames in there so that the bee space is correct, so they don't build it sideways and, and make a mess out of it. And then um, once you have your drawn combs, you can go to nine and then to eight once everything's all drawn out. And they can pretty much, on eight frames, put as much honey as they can. It's just the beekeeper has to handle one less frame. And so that's a technique used by the, the beekeeper. Um, it should not be seen. This is actually a picture It's kind of out of focus. I'm going to work with my wife, the photographer, to get some new pictures. But um, that's a queen cell hatching. Um, you know, I, my philosophy is that's not a bad thing. Um, that's a $20 queen right there. And uh, I can really see them hanging in the trees or flying off where I can't get to them. But uh, the ones that I do catch you know, certainly make up for the ones that I don't catch. But uh, that's a sign of a good, healthy hive. If you're doing things right, you're going to see this. But they, uh, a lot of people talk bad about it. Throwing swarms is bad. But, you know, dead bees don't ever swarm. Oh. Um, this is a virgin queen around in there, but it's out of focus. And their virgin queens are, are real tough to spot. But they're not very big. They actually fly very fast. Is on the 16th day. She needs four or five days to mature, and then that next 10 day period is the only time in her life that she can mate. And so, if your weather's bad or things didn't work out quite right, on that 11th day, you can look in there and know if your queen's going to work or not. There's just a, a time period that uh, nature has, and, and at that point, you need to re queen cell or, or put a, a mated queen in there or graft in there if you don't have those eggs at that time. Um, this is a good picture. You can see the egg in the bottom at the top of that arrow. And so that's a nice white egg. It's standing up. And they actually, when the queen lays them, she uh, glues them to the bottom of the, the frame. And they actually stand on their end just like that. And so they all stand up and, and look very good. You can also see the larva in there. And if you look, the larva looks like it's floating. And that is royal jelly in the bottom of there. Um, royal jelly is fed to all the larvae um, after they hatch after the third day. For the first 72 hours, all the larvae get royal jelly. The royal jelly is fed to a queen bee her whole life, where the diet changes after 72 hours for the worker bee. Um, they're malnourished, and it takes a few days for the worker to hatch. The metabolism slows down, and they don't develop completely. Um, bee diseases. This is an important one. This is American fowl brood. This is what, this is what makes beekeepers shudder. Um, that, uh, um, I'm the Cache County Bee Inspector and also the Box Elder County Bee Inspector because this is a communicable disease, meaning that if you get it, your neighbor's going to get it and everybody around you is going to get it, and it is very, very contagious. This is a, a case that's really gone for, on for a long time. Uh, what happens is it's layering a brood disease, and the brood dies, and then it turns into a, a gummy glue, and it's really sticky. You can stick a, a piece of uh, um, grass in it, and if you pull the grass out and it sti sticks and it strings, that's definitely American fowl brood. It's the only thing that does that. 
And at that time, then this hive needs to be taken care of. Um, there's several ways to do it, but uh, it, it's not that you're a bad beekeeper, it's just that you missed a management step somewhere along the way, and your bees are sick. Um, this, is, yeah, this shows the rope here. So when the bees try to clean that out, they get all sticky. It gets all gummy all over them. And that's what makes it so that uh, it spreads very quickly. Because bees will drift from hive to hive, and uh, then they'll take it to the next hive and the next hive, and it, it goes, especially drones. Drones, um, once they're out and flying, they'll be in every hive. They just go around and get honey. Uh, the old way of treating American fowl brood was to burn the colony, the bees, and the woodenware and everything. What science has found out lately is that a wood fire, the hottest one, will get about 900, 800, 900 degrees. It takes 16 to 1800 to kill fowl brood. So the only thing you were doing by burning it was actually atomizing it and getting it up into the atmosphere and blowing it all the way downwind. Um, it takes a lot more heat than that to kill fowl brood. It is, uh, Foul brood can be frozen really cold for 18, 20 years. It can live in the soil. It is, is really hard to get rid of. And so um, the best way is Thailand or teramycin. Uh, teramycin, both of those are an antibiotic. Teramycin was used for a long time, and they put it in a terra patty, they called it, which was a protein patty with uh, teramycin in it. And that was called an extender patty. But that gave them that antibiotic for too long of a period, and the fowl brood became resistant to it. So Thailand is the new antibiotic. Um, Caramycin lasted for about seven days. Thailand lasts for 30 days. And uh, takes a lot less of it, cleans it up, and uh, you're off and running. That way the bees have the immunity to the American fowl brood. They clean it up, throw it out the door. It sits in front of the hive and goes into the soil, and it's not a problem anymore. Of burning it, which you know throws it all downwind. This way, it's centrally located. The soil breaks it down, and, and you're done with it. Um, American fowl brood is a secondary disease. Um, it used to be a, a huge, huge problem pre World War II, um, where they didn't have the paramycin and the antibiotics. They had sul sulfur or sulfate or sulfur. That's the file. But uh, nowadays, it's really not a big problem. It is a secondary disease, so if you have mites and your hive starts to dwindle or your hive gets sick, then foul brood is going to be easier to set in. It's just like people. You know, if you're up on your, your diet, you know, meaning you eat right, you exercise, then um, you're a lot healthier. And uh, bees are the same way. If they get the flu, they get a virus um, that's carried by the mites, say, um, deformed wing virus or, or any of those, then once that sets in, then the whole hive is sicker, and then foul brood can set in a lot easier. Once you start going downhill, then the ball really starts rolling fast. No, they're not. Last year, the study disc came out that they did nationally. On a national level, um, we're at 38% winter losses. Um, 38 sounds like a big number, but the, here's the problem of it. If you approach 50%, that's the threshold number. Anything below 50%, 38%, we can rebuild in the springtime. Meaning if we have 1,000 colonies, we lose 38% of them, we can rebuild from what we've got to get back to 1,000 colonies. We're okay. We keep getting closer to that number where we can't rebuild back. So say um, we get closer to 50%, we have 1,000 colonies, we have our winter losses, we can only build back to 990. Well, the following year, if it keeps going, we can only build back to 980. That's when we're going to really start to see a problem and a lot of panic set in the industry. Right now, everybody's kind of doing what they can and trying to keep their finger in the dike on what's going on with the nutrition, whether it, it you know, everybody's trying a whole gamut and, they, you know, the labs are doing what they can, I guess. But uh, we're spending a lot of money on it. But still, every year, we climb 3 to 4% on an average basis. And they send out a very detailed um, survey of beekeepers on, and, and get some pretty good numbers off of it. But that still keeps climbing. It, it, the, the bees are, it's not only the honeybees also. There's a lot of varieties of bumblebees that are monitored. Um, the University of Lincoln, Nebraska, has a huge bumblebee program. And there's two of the varieties of bumblebees they can't even find anymore. They're calling them extinct. 
And so it's not only the honeybee, it's all pollinators. Um, the, the leaf cutters are struggling, the digger bees are struggling. There, there is not the pollinators out there that there used to be, the secondary pollinators, other than the honeybees. Um, I'm getting a lot more, more calls from gardeners. You know, I've got to have bees, my squash isn't setting my... There's a, a gardener that runs a huge row crop in Layton, um, Zoe's Garden, David Chin is his name. Um, he has a huge amount. His whole income he provides for restaurants and farmers markets and everything. And he starts calling me in January. Am I going to have bees? When do I get my bees? When are they going to be here? And he calls me every week. Then he then calls my sister. And so it, he, uh, and he's told us directly, he says, Martin, without your bees, I will not be in business. He says, you increased my production by one third, but he says, my quality overall doubled. And he says, the, everything is better. And he says, I've got to have your bees. He says, I know for a fact it was the bees. Um, because, you know, he lives right in the center of Layton, so that's where the farm is. And uh, he's really struggling with pollination. And so you may not, you know, see it quite yet, but if things keep going, then, then you will. Um, just right out here, um, Mike um, has a, a CSA garden out here by Tom's service. And uh, he called up this spring, and, and we chatted, and he says, I can't get my squash to set. Because squash, when they come out, they have a blossom. And if it doesn't get pollinated that day, it dies and falls off. And that's what was happening. So I took some colonies out and sat there, and overnight, we started producing squash. So there are pockets in the valley already that don't have pollination. So it, uh, it's important. Um, this is a picture of queen cells. You can kind of see a, um, this one in the middle of the comb, they tend to call that a supersedure cell, that the bees are trying to replace the queen around the edges, like there, they call swarm cells where it's out on the edge of the swarm. I've never quite figured that out. I've looked at thousands of bees and, and watched them, and, you know, sometimes they just need a new queen. <laughs> Um, that's a picture of a mouse nest. You know, if you see grass or leaves or such in your hive, looking, that's looking up at the bottom of the hive. Um, the bottom picture here is you can see where the grass has been worn away. Skunks in Cache Valley are a problem. Um, they sit in front of the hive like that and they, they scratch, they dig. And then they scratch at the hive, the bees come out. They have a tongue that must be that long. And it just cleans that bottom, that landing pad off, and they just eat the bees. And uh, they can eat a frame of bees a night. It, uh, they're quite devastating. Um, also, when you go into a bee yard where the skunks are uh, ravaging them like that, the bees are mad. They don't like you in there they, they, because they're nocturnal. Bees just like we do. They go to bed just after sunset, sleep in until 9, 10 in the morning. And so without that sleep, it can become pretty grouchy. And if the skunks are keeping them up, it's also the most very grouchy. So that's fine. You know, if you're there in your backyard, um, you'll have to do something with the skunks, I'm sure. Um, there's a, that's a picture of the wax moth there in the center that we talked about a little bit. Um, the varroa mite is down there on the bottom. That's a, a picture on a young larva that has been pulled out in the pupation stage, probably about the 20th day. And that's the cycle of the mite. It actually lays its eggs in with the larva. And then the bees seal it up on the eighth day. Well, those baby mites are sealed in there too. And they feed on that pupa and then hatch right along with the pupa. And so that's their food supply to the baby bees. That's why they're really hard to control is they're not on the outside of the bees all the time. They're sealed within those wax and that protects them. Um, to kind of give you an idea, if I had a Varroa mite on me, by size, it would be the size of my fist. So you can imagine that stuck between your shoulder blades, biting you and feeding off of you, trying to get that off, that, what your nerves would do. You know, the, it, all kinds of bad things. Um, um, this is just going on to the, the next talk. Of, we can do that. I don't know how much time I've got left, but this just goes through and breaks down the spring management a little bit in a lot more detail. This is kind of an overview of what I just told you, um, but it goes into a, a lot more detail. Any questions? Oh. <laughs>
Alrighty, my mom's brought a, a kind of a fun thing. Um, this Jan last January, we released a, a vinegar that's made exclusively from honey. So we take the honey and we uh, ferment it into mead. We add water and yeast, and then we take that uh, wine and turn it into vinegar with mother or acerbators. This is the way vinegar was made 500 years ago. Um, it's our, our new product, so I thought I'd share that with you, kind of as a product of the hive, and kind of what we do a little bit. Um, how much do I have left? Oh, well, let's just chit chat for 10 minutes and. Um, salad dressings are, are really easy. It goes really good on any type of salad, a spinach salad with a little bit of feta.